Are you ready to go, Sakshi? Yes, Bindi. Hello. Live. Thank you. Okay, so. Hello and welcome. Uh, good morning, good evening for those joining in from the West Coast. Uh, this is the last of our sessions in uh, Disrupt Philanthropy or the Philanthropy Vertical, as we call it. Um, and it's a very important session to end it with. We've discussed the why, what, how so far. And this is further looking at the how, um, you know, and looking at one of the most important subject matters that has been highlighted in the last uh, two years that we've been almost in a lockdown state. If you think about it, I mean, I think right now all of us are joining in from various parts of the world using technology extensively. Uh, wonder how the nonprofits were using tech or what were they doing and how were they coping during these difficult times. We, the study done by CSIP, um, which is just completed on the impact of COVID uh, prior to the second wave, but some pieces also looking at the second wave, about 61% had uh, reported uh, a challenge in operating in the norm. Uh, and 70% reported about uh, finding a difficulty managing staff report, uh, remotely. And so even if 50% of mo them moved on uh, the digital realm and moved towards tech, they've complained about not having enough funds, not knowing what to do, uh, not knowing how to go about finding a vendor. And so we thought, why don't we invite a group of philanthropists and some experts from the space to talk about it um, and tell us how we should be thinking about technology, how uh, they can push their peers to think more about technology. So uh, why don't we start out? Uh, Rekha, I would like to invite you. Uh, the first person who will be talking uh, with us is Rekha Koita, who's the director and co-founder of Koita Foundation. Um, an organization that works with NGOs and nonprofit organizations to leverage technology. Uh, Rekha herself is an engineer and has worked in the space of, uh, you know, uh, uh, talking, uh, helping nonprofit organizations. Uh, and so I would love to know your journey, Rekha, in terms of what was the thought process when you started this foundation? Uh, and then how have you moved ahead in this journey in your terms of how you are helping nonprofit organizations? So why don't we start with you? Thank you. Thank you, Bindi. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to this forum. Uh, happy to be here. So, um, you know, when I think back on my journey, I think we began this journey around five years ago. And at that time, um, you know, the only thing I knew was that I wanted to help nonprofits to enhance impact and to you know, impact effectiveness, effectiveness of the programs and the impact they're creating in society and help them to scale. Now, that's all I actually went in with, uh, not knowing about how I should go about it, just in an exploratory phase. However, as we started engaging with NGOs, we realized that in order to, you know, either enhance impact or to drive scale, you know, there were many, uh, many challenges, many kind of roadblocks that they faced in the process. And of course, we realized that it's, you know, we cannot address all of those, uh, you know, issues. But one of the things that came to us, you know, at the forefront, which we felt was a need, a gap in the in the in the ecosystem, a strong need, and something which aligned well with our own strengths and experience was this whole area of you know process and technology. So what we realized is that by um, you know due to lack of streamlined processes, which are again in turn not supported by the right technology or the right tools, right? that was creating a big impediment to to you know to the ngos right in terms of one is their efficiencies efficiency might be the most obvious of the things right but it's you know so you have without the proper tech tools you have low efficiency in a system which is already constrained for resources so that was you know the number one thing which was like the low hanging fruit we jumped out of it uh, but as we kind of worked more and we started, you know, we were working primarily in the areas of livelihood, education, and, uh, you know, healthcare. And we still continue to focus on those areas. What we realized is that the effectiveness of the programs also was impacted by, um, you know, by a lack of tools. For example, we found in the maternal and child health space in our work with both Sneha and FMCH, where you have field workers who are handling, say, 200 to 50 families. You know, they are, um, you know, they are unable to, you know, they spend so much of time just planning, figuring out, okay, whom do I need to meet today? Because they don't have an automated schedule. So the field worker who could spend an extra hour or so on the field is spending that one, one and a half hours just planning her day. 
and then this also that exercise continues on a monthly weekly basis there's a risk of you know not missing out somebody who might actually need to be met so there were lots of such factors which kind of came into play you know so one is that low effectiveness of the program lower effectiveness and also because you don't have the data you don't actually know what's happening in the field uh, very recently a couple of months back we implemented a decision tree app uh, for fmch and one of the things they realized is that the anthropometry which is you know the measurement of the weight and height of the mother and child which is supposed to be done on a monthly basis was not being done i know as often as they thought in many of the communities so that lack of data also you it's difficult to monitor the programs and also you unless you feed data back into the system how do you improve on what you're doing so the whole effectiveness piece was a very big thing so we realized that technology is not like many people think about it as oh we need mis a lot of ngos when i speak to them they said we need mis systems we need to automate but it's not automation it is far more than that it is effectiveness it is impact it is also ability to scale when you have a system which is you know which has various technology elements you're kind of you know modularizing your entire program and it makes it much easier for you to scale to other locations with partners or even without that and it enables non linear scale so i think these are some of the very important factors that we felt uh, you know um where we felt technology was a was a huge huge advantage um, and there are a few other factors which i can also talk about later but uh, you know such as um, ability to even empower ben beneficiaries technology can help you to change the whole narrative at antarang foundation we have implemented a job search app which is for the students so it's a student facing app so the students they were in a scenario where when they uh, work with youth and they try to help them to get jobs uh, it's livelihood program now the way it was working is that the placement team was pushing it was a push system placement team was pushing the, the young uh, you know the young adults to you know okay you have an interview please come you know take your interview look for this job here we kind of flipped it around and we created a whole way system that we kind of you know help to engage students and tell them that hey this is a customized list of opportunities which are just for you and you know that helps to shift the narrative a little so technology can be used in various ways i also feel and this is especially relevant in the current i mean one is of course with covid i think everybody has understood the importance because people have had to pivot to online but i think due to the whole you know fundraising uh, challenges that people are currently facing also i think technology helps you to put your program together it also helps you to tell your story better and to engage with donors in a more meaningful way with actual with actual hard numbers i think it can in a sense uh in a different way of looking at it is is that it's also a fundraising tool so these are some of the things and some of the reasons why we felt technology was very important and why we decided to get into it is because we felt especially at that time that while it's an area of great importance there is a kind of gap in the air you know in the marketplace i would say or in the ecosystem where the ngos may not be as aware of the strategic impact of technology and why they need to invest you know time and resources into technology and from the philanthropy side where people there is not as much funding available for um technology and of course it aligned well with uh, you know our interest areas being from technical backgrounds i've worked in consulting and uh, you know rizwan my husband and co-founder who is running an it firm so it aligned very well with our own areas of expertise and ability to help them out so that's the reason why we decided to get into this thank you rekha Uh, uh let me invite lobo i think lobo has been in the space uh running the chintu gudia foundation for i don't know as long as i've been in the sector at least uh runs a private family foundation and it's based out of san francisco but he works with um, a lot of uh, indian ngos uh, on open source software and on uh, various other interventions over there he's a lead developer and the co-founder also of civi crm Uh, so donald why don't you uh, walk us through your journey and what prompted you i think you work extensively and you know do a lot of hand holding with non profit organizations um so what's your thought process why didn't you why did you get into this space and then um, what prompted you to keep pushing uh, towards uh, various interventions in technology so cool uh, thanks bendy and thanks for having me on this forum um a so side kind of build on some of the things that reka mentioned and probably also kind of talk about a few things where where we think probably a wee bit differently um so 
so bottom line right i do think that technology is super important and i do think that technology is useful but at the same time we also think that technology is not the solution to the problem right i think it's important for ngos to have really good processes really good uh, practices and kind of know what they're trying to solve and how they're solving it and technology then will enable them to help solve that problem and um and the story of the I means the way we came about this was very similar to what reka and her foundation did right again like 5 to 10 5 years ago or so again talking with some of the ngos that we've invested in and we were working with closely it was a bit shocking a bit surprising and actually a lot sad that many of the things that we thought uh, that were from a technical perspective being from a technical background were really really simple these ngos were putting in human resources to basically say generate graphs and charts on a daily basis use uh, from excel right rather than automating that and so we had this experience with a few different ngos and we said like hey this really cannot uh, we cannot really continue doing this forward uh, going forward why don't we try to figure out and come up with a program where we can help ngos work with technology uh, the other aspect of our thinking is um, many of the problems across the sector are fairly common to many ngos uh, within that sector or uh, to many ngos within the space but the one thing which is really lacking which is lacking within the ngo space especially in india today is there are very few shared solutions and there are very few solutions which use platforms and atul will talk about give india as a platform right and i think one of the amazing uh, opportunities that platforms offer is you can onboard lots and lots of ngos for fairly minimal cost right so you can you can amortize your cost uh, across many ngos and at the same time develop a super powerful platform and especially with the pandemic where a lot more ngos are willing and uh, are willing to listen and are willing to adopt platforms rather than custom solutions we've kind of taken a semi pivot and said like all we are going to focus on going forward is platforms primarily because we can onboard a lot more ngos it's really good and efficient for the sector the business world like if you look at salesforce netsuite um, g suite and everything right the business world around the world has moved to platforms a few years ago and i also think it's time that the ngo sector especially in india start moving to platforms at a really fast rate right and so that's what tech for dev has been focusing on so i think um the places where we focus on are open source which basically allows us to share technology across multiple ngos in the sector platforms which allow us to onboard multiple ngos at the same time for minimal cost uh, hence uh, having a fair bit of cost saving and having one uh, entity drive the development in a significant banner um and knowledge sharing right the one thing which we are really intent on building in india is this community of practitioners like both within the tech world and in the ngo world to share resources to share answers to kind of help each other out and lean each other, lean on each, each other and and so i would say those are the three major areas that both tech for dev and chintu gudia are, are are working on and we do realize that we cannot work on this in isolation right so we collaborate with a bunch of foundations including including the kaiya foundation and atcf uh, on the skull and a bunch of funders and a bunch of software partners all around india because ngos are spread across india and we do think physical location uh, in the absence of the pandemic is actually a good thing uh, right and physical proximity really helps ngos get that comfort level Uh, so that's the way we look at the problem, and that's uh, that's what we are trying to address and solve, um, Bindi. Thank you, Lobo. Uh, let me invite my third speaker for the day, Gayatri. Uh, Gayatri is the CEO of ATE Chandra Foundation, and she brings about close to 20 years of strategy and consulting um, in the development sector. When I met her, I think she was CEO of. Uh, Teach for India, and then CEO of ISLI, uh, so in the education space for quite some time. But um, I think doing some interesting work at ATE, and Gayatri, it would be nice. I think um, Lobo talked extensively about tools for public good or open source in that sense, and I know ATCF focuses a lot on tools for public good and building things for the sector. So, could you talk a little bit about one what ATCF does, and then what's your focus in terms of data process and tech and why is it so important so so happy to 
Um, I think I'm the one person in this panel who's not a tech expert, so I think might give a different perspective. I mean, we we may not understand tech, but we definitely see the value of tech, um, and I'll tell you why. So the AD Chandra Foundation, we focus on capacity building of nonprofits. Now this ranges from you know building their capacities to do better fundraising, better communications, uh, data and M and E. Essentially, whatever is required for an NGO poised for growth to really strengthen itself and then scale. Now, one very important aspect of that is tech. Uh, we tend to, of course, lean on experts like Lobo and others, but but we know that investing in tech is actually going to help these nonprofits. I would say with you know effectiveness, like Rekha said, efficiency, and I think the last one being transparency. Um, and you know what one of the things we do almost as a process for this is really help these nonprofits think about their theory of change right so what is the data you require in order to make the impact that you want to make or that you're striving to make and what is that data flow going to look like so what is the input what are the uh, outputs what's the outcome etc and in fact you know sometimes when you go through that process you realize you're actually collecting more data than you need um, and it, it it really helps you think about for decision making, what is the kind of information I need and what the quickest way very often to get that data is technology. Um, it's it's helps with decision making, not just uh, because of the robustness of the data, but also because of the timeliness of the data. So, so it's quicker and better decisions that can be made using tech. Um, just to give you an example of one of the, uh, you know, products or you know the data the uh, sorry tech tech pieces that we funded recently um, we do a lot of work in water so what we do is a rejuvenation of existing water bodies help them become um, you know better storage water bodies both above the uh, ground and below i won't get into the tech the technical parts of the water but what we realized is that there is so much of information that and processes that need to be done in a 30 to 45 day period. Um, there is the government is involved, the nonprofits are involved, community is involved, and funders are involved, not just us, but other funders as well. So, in order to make sure that everybody knew what was happening, we knew where we were in the process across, you know, maybe thousand water bodies we're doing in the country, we required um, good solid data. So we helped build an app. When I say help build, we, we funded somebody else to build an app, which would capture this data, which allowed, um, you know, permissions to be given by the government authorities on the app. It allowed donors to see where we were, in which water body where they had funded. It allowed the nonprofits to know which farmer has collected data. And the data is authentic because the farmer gets an OTP on their phone, which then goes into the app. So it was, you know, so it's, it's, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm simplifying it a lot, but what you got at the end was a very efficient system. We've now translated into um, Marathi and um, Kannada for usage in those states, and it's, it's very easy to just anyone to plug in and, and you know, use this data and use this system. So it was like, you know, when I was talking about public good, this is made for anybody who wants to do this work. Whether we know them or not, they are free to use this app. And that that we thought was really important for the sector. Um, I'll stop there, but I think just the big, big thing message that I wanted to leave was that um, you know, having technology can really make systems, processes, program much more efficient, effective, and transparent. Thank you, Gayatri. Um, we invite our last and final speaker for the panel. I don't think he needs an introduction today, but uh, the CEO of uh, Nudge, who's hosting this wonderful event, and the CEO of Give India. Um, Atul's been in the tech space for, uh, I don't know, Atul, I don't know how long now, but and has shown his success in that the for-profit world and now in the non-profit world. But today, we're not picking his brain for Chacha or for uh, Nudge, but we want to pick his brain for the whole piece on Give India, how you've moved from 1.0 to 2.0 um, and how retail uh, you've brought in because considering what has happened in the last year and, you know, more than 50% NGOs that we surveyed uh, talk about you know, less than six months of funding. Um, and so with yeah. a lot of funding going towards COVID, especially from philanthropists and CSR, 
I think this importance coming from retail is becoming even more important. So, um, could you talk a little bit more uh, in terms of how you think about platforms, both from the institutional perspective and from the retail perspective? Yeah. So, Bindi, firstly, thanks for so much uh, uh, for having me here. It's a it's a great uh, panel, and a lot of people have been doing directly technology centric work, uh, helping the nonprofits. Uh, when I joined Give India about four years back, uh, you know, uh, uh, it looked like a platform uh, which is a website uh, where people are coming and giving donations. Uh, but if you look at the history of Give India, I think what Venkat had done really well is always remain ahead on technology from the day one of Give India. We were one of the first few websites in the country to have payment options to give donations online, like one of the early e-commerce websites in the country. One of our uh, very early volunteers uh, discovered this amazing thing that, you know, a lot of our community institutions are built by people pooling in money locally, a community park, a community school, a community hospital, things like that, right? When people have traveled from their villages to nearby cities, to bigger cities, to global cities, the ability to trust people around you and pool money starts to become more and more difficult. Right? It's not easy. So in 2005 and six, uh, you know, we brought this platform concept of having a nonprofit or an organization put a project in the center and different people can come together and donate. That was the birth of crowdfunding and that was pre Kickstarter worldwide. So Give India was one of the early sort of front runners in actually creating the crowdfunding ecosystem, starting from our work in India. Uh, and over the sort of course of this journey, we've had the platforms where the nonprofits are due diligence and verified, and then they're on the platform. And anybody can find the work that nonprofits are doing uh, just by going to our website and looking for this. So I think a lot of these investments were there. But when I joined uh, Give India in 2017, what I learned is that people who build these platforms actually built it out of extreme goodwill as volunteers or as contributors to the, the system. But as they moved on, it was very difficult to manage, build upon, maintain, and scale the platform. So one of the first things we did is to realize that, you know, back in those days, payments were sorted. Mobile penetration wasn't much, data wasn't cheap, users were not online as much, commerce habits to pay online weren't built. So I had this amazing opportunity of a great platform, technology first thinking in the company, but no technology team. And the historical opportunity was not the same that I kind of inherited at the time I joined. So the first things we did is we said, look, we can't scale the giving ecosystem in the country if we don't have our own in-house technology team. So we actually build a, a product and technology team and put that in the center of Give India. So we'll build on top of this. And I think we realized that the early investments in 17, 18 to build the technology platform really allowed us when COVID happened because we could scale. Uh, Pre-COVID, we tried various things, obviously, and people come forward and donate when there is, you know, sort of say a disaster or a need on the ground. Uh, but COVID obviously brought the need for giving at a very different level. And the fact that we were ready allowed us to take that. We have close to 1.5 million people, 15 lakh people who have come forward and donated. And there were times during uh, this sort of journey of COVID fundraising where the traffic on the website would go 40 times more. And the website would crash for like a second, but we would quickly recover. So the investments allowed us to be able to take the generosity that was out there uh, for COVID and put it in this. Now that's most a manifestation of it, but the core of it is to be able to invest in that. There are uh, two, three things you have to do in giving to make giving bigger uh, as the first uh, uh, sort of goalpost. Retail donors want to give when they know that the money is going to be used in full exactly for what you're telling me you'll use the money for. So transparency and the trust is very, very important for a donor. You also have to realize that, you know, in this busy world, giving is discretionary. It is not like my plumbing has broken and I can't survive without it. You know, if nothing happens, if I don't give, nothing happens, then I can very well not give for uh, next month or next year or for the rest of my life. So making giving easier and convenient is also important. 
you can make a unwieldy product people come consume the product but not give and they leave so making the platform intuitive going where the users are on third party websites making sure that the payments are safe secure end users are verified the choice is available on the platform people come and donate and quickly they know that the money is being deployed for the right reason and you get the reports and utilization back so i think instrumenting that online was one of the first things we did how do you make sure that there is a platform availability there is transparency there is trust there is utilization report there is impact report all of that instrumentation and on top of that then we started looking at innovations required to make giving uh, bigger by converting one time donors to monthly subscription donors so you take people on the journey of impulse giving to one time giving feeling good about it and then making them committed givers and that required newer products and platforms to be built on top of the existing give india system that we had so that's on the retail side with covid this year we started spending a lot of time and effort to also help institutional givers foundations corporates and philanthropists give better and give faster but because we work with 2300 plus ngos on our platform right now we have a very good ringside view of the work happening on the ground we are not the man in the arena right but we are still having a very good view of what's happening in the non profit ecosystem so when a corporate or a foundation or a philanthropist is looking at giving we are able to share the information of what we know which is sitting actually like a technology platform where we can just quickly search for organizations working with cancer patients uh, in northern part of india and they are not a hospital they want to serve the hospital so we can quickly find these specific use cases and take it to philanthropist and do it in the institutional giving ecosystem what is very important is not uh, as much about trust and transparency because institutions can solve it themselves but what is really important is how do you look at the data collections the monitoring the evaluation the impact report knowing that giving is actually making a difference and it is not just to feel good for me as a donor and there i think a lot of things that uh, uh, you know all the other three panelists guy three donald and rekha mentioned looking at the efficiency layer of giving to starting to look at how can you basically move from just efficiency of running programs to making programs more effective to then looking at transformating transformative technology that allows you to conceptualize programs that you can't even conceptualize without technology i don't think we in, in india are at that level yet but the fact that you have mobile and data at the last mile available at large scale in the country i think a lot of future innovations will come at transformative use of technology to create programs that are built with only technology in mind and not a program that you know technology is helping improve so we're looking increasingly in that journey and i think it's still very early days to make giving sharp and smart and that is where our investments are now going in thanks atul uh, i think that's a really interesting view point from across uh, very four different views uh, but i think all of you hinted across the board at something which is very strategic giving right like even when atul talked about how give india is built your investors probably thought really strategically to let you build that platform up uh, to move to that level where you were ready to explore in that sense that you have in the last year year and a half uh but i know rekha mentioned very briefly initially when she started out about strategic giving but what is the thought process in terms of and this is for all four of you at some level in terms of foundations or uh philanthropists and even retail givers because atul you mentioned retail givers only want to give to program so what is the thought when you know investing in tech or investing because it's not just that you need tech for program you need tech for like guy three said mne and data so if if any of you want to chime in and talk about it and what your thoughts and how strategic giving should be done with non profit organizations when you think about technology should i invite somebody or uh... sure i can jump in and i'll uh, i'll kind of put both on both my funder hat on and my fundee hat on right since i kind of operate in both spaces um so the one thing which i keep telling ngos is right if internally you're treating um technology as an overhead you cannot expect funders to treat it differently if you always think that technology or anything that you do from a tech perspective you're always going to tack it on as overheads or beyond the program cost 
even though you need all that stuff to run the program, you're basically doing yourself a disservice. And agreed, a lot of funders today, when you incorporate uh, the tech, tech costs and other costs into your program, are going to kind of, means you'll probably get rejections from nine out of 10 of them or eight out of 10 of them. But you'll get the one or two who are the early, uh, who are willing to push the edge of the envelope, listen to you. And we've got examples of this, right? Shelter five years ago, Shelter Associates in Pune run by Pratima, right? Five years ago would never incorporate technology as part of their uh, grants, right? Today, every proposal that goes out, technology is just considered an inherent part of the proposal. And I do think that NGOs have this responsibility to incorporate technology as, a, as an essential part of the uh, program uh, running and operations. Uh, and on the flip side, I, I do think that um, foundations have to start giving a bit more liberally, a bit, a, a lot less restrictions, etc. But I think the uh, the nonprofit world kind of beats uh, many of those things to death. So I won't really go into that too much. Sure. Uh, anyone else want to chime in on that? Or I could, yeah, I sure I could jump in. So I think, I mean, I agree with everything that uh, Donald has said and just adding on. So I think the way we look at uh, what we encourage our NGOs to do and when we, are, we start working right with any new organization, our first step is to actually just understand what they do, right? What are their programs? What is their organization structure like? And, uh, you know, what is the team like? And therefore, then also try to understand what are the key kind of, you know, key issues and challenges that they are facing and what do they really need to solve for first, right? Because I think an important thing is that here in the, the NGOs, because they have money is one part, right? Now, as a funder, you are planning to give them the money. But the, the other part of it is also that the NGO has to be able to be in a position to kind of really implement whatever you are trying to do. Uh, like, uh, you know, Donald had said earlier also, process is very important, right? Because without the right systems, people and processes, the technology is of no use. So to understand in, the, in this kind of a, you know, like a limited resource kind of environment, where is it, you know, where is it that they are facing the biggest challenge and where can therefore technology help them to resolve that challenge? You know, so where should you identify the problem is very important because there are times when we have had an NGO come to us and say, uh, you know, that we want to kind of implement some, maybe a payroll processing system, or it could be that, you know, we have this, this issue. Uh, recently, I was talking to Masum, uh, where we have implemented a system for all their 85 schools. They said, you know, we have a career cell and this is what we want to do. But I said, you know, what you're trying to do is just automation. We need to do something for the students. So really to take, I think as funders, we have to take that call to help them to think strategically about technology because sometimes they may or not, may or not be, they are in the thick of things. They may or may not be able to take that kind of outside view or perspective. So I think that is also part of our role as philanthropists and funders, foundations to really help them to see where is it that you will kind of in a way get the most bang for the buck in terms of your effectiveness, your programs. And that could be to a programmatic thing. Like at FMCH, they said that, you know, we have an issue that we train the field workers but then when they're going on to the field, we actually don't know if they're follow following the entire protocol because you train them and then, you know, they go on to the field. And then we cannot scale using this because we're finding it difficult to scale with partner organizations because we, you know, it's hard to control then what's happening. So the dis a decision tree app or scheduling app helps them to modularize the program and scale. So that's a strategic investment. It's not an MIS tool. Then in the case of Magic Bus, it was it was more of an ME thing because they're spread out all over the country with like you know close to four lakh beneficiaries. How do you monitor and make sure that things are all right? So there will be different things for different NGOs, and philanthropists need to help them to see that. And also to help them to build their organization to be able to take it forward. So do they have a, you know, do they have a team? Do they have the people in place? And the third thing, last point I'd like to make is, I think an important pa part of this whole thing is to help them to streamline the processes also along with implementing the tech, because that comes first. And to involve the, the beneficiaries and the user group. So for example, when uh, we were doing the Antaram student app for job placement, we actually went and visited three to four communities and spoke to the students. So to understand, you know, what is it that the beneficiary will want? What, how will they find it easy? I think that also is an important factor. Just, just keep in mind as part of the entire, uh, may not exactly fall under the piece of strategic, but in a way it is because it helps you to actually get things 
you know, get things done and get things successfully implemented. So what I'm hearing both Rita and Lobo from you is actually philanthropists somewhere need to really invest time and effort to bring, you know, uh, organizations up to speed. But uh, is it is it even possible, right? Like, I mean, if I look at philanthropic foundations and organizations and Gayatri, you can talk from your experience as well since you work in capacity building or, uh, you know, even Atul would like to hear from you. Uh, what how difficult is it because we can't i mean it's wonderful the work logo and rekha are doing in terms of hand holding and bringing ngos up to speed but if you are talking about the magnitude and the large scale if you want to reach to the number of ngos we have in the country um potentially what is the platform play or who can come in over here or what can we do to bring ngos to that level where they can even start um putting tech as their core and not just tech for operation, tech for fundraising. I think it's very important, um, you know, even if they want to go retail or tech for brand image marketing, uh, how, what do you think can be done out there or what, what are your thoughts on this? So Bindi, a couple of uh, different pieces here. See, one is uh, if somebody was to go and do a for-profit startup today uh, as a digital business, there is so much technology available around you packaged as services that you don't have to worry about. Even engineers don't have to code as much as they had to code earlier to bring the same outcome, right? So the ecosystem around makes it easier for you to leverage the benefit of technology. And I think a lot of that in our sector development ecosystem has to happen. We don't have job portals for the ecosystem. We don't have information portals for the ecosystem. We don't have an easy place to go and say, who are the funders investing in education in rural parts of, let us say, Tamil Nadu. There is no information available easily digitally, whether it's for jobs, whether it's for networking, whether it's for access, whether it is for knowledge, learnings, failure. So, so one layer is that philanthropists and foundations is not a CSR play, have to invest in independent technology products and platforms that make it easier for a nonprofit to benefit from technology without thinking technology. That is one layer. That layer is almost entirely missing in the country. The second then is to go back and say, look, as a nonprofit, you can't get, like you can get a data collection app that works offline uh, and those tools can be made available. But to have investments within your own design of the program integrated into that to make sure that your program is leveraging technology has to happen within the program that you can't just pick from elsewhere. A lot of that investment is what I'm hearing sort of, you know, Rekha is spending a lot of time, effort, capital in actually working with specific nonprofits and specific programs and investing in that. And I think we need a lot more donors with that level of wisdom and commitment to technology improving programs. So there is that play as well. The third one is, is a very difficult one where you say, look, can you imagine technology for solutions for development? Because, you know, people coming to development are not coming because they see an economic opportunity to solve a problem. They see a social problem and that's where their energy is. My hope is that because of a large technology ecosystem, some trickle down from there will happen, which will allow people to imagine technology for solutions like in EdTech and health tech. You need that in many, many areas. That's the most difficult one where you need technology incubators for the nonprofit sector, where you encourage people to come and think technology for solutions for, for the ecosystem. So I think it need, it's needed everywhere. Now coming to the retail giving side, uh, Pindi, I think what needs to happen is that uh, the, the funding ecosystem that is interested in actual development and not just for compliance and you know sort of other reasons, they have to also partner with the nonprofits to make sure that we are designing programs that have technology cost integrated. Because reality is that CSR won't fund technology directly. Retail donors also don't come here to fund technology. They come here to fund a meal, a cataract surgery, a child scholarship or things like that. If you say, give me $100 to build technology, nobody's gonna give money, unfortunately. But what we need to do is I want to work with nonprofits to say, look, if it is going to cost you $100 to build technology and another $100 serves 100 students, your program cost is $2 per student, not $1 per student, one per technology. So you blend the technology cost within and design your cost structure so that when you go to people, you are able to transparently say where the cost is, but still are able to put an impact which is integrated with technology. I don't think that is happening enough. A lot of nonprofits, 
don't see it that way because donors ask questions differently so we need to ask questions differently and work with them to kind of have blended uh, cost structure so that technology investments become easier for non profits to raise money for and that part is still very early stage actually in the ecosystem Kaitri, you want to talk about? I mean, I know capacity building is the main for ATC. So I just want to bring in your thoughts in terms of how the ecosystem should be thinking about this, or how funders should be investing in it. So yeah, so I think I think one thing that uh, you know doesn't automatically come with technology is change thinking, right? So if you're still your processes might change, your technology might change, but um, we we feel that you need to work with the leadership team, help them understand that. this is how your decision making is going to change this is how data is going to flow into you uh, this is how your you know meeting should be held where you're looking at data unless all of that is also done and you have experts on the team so we we would fund a tech person on that team to be able to run this through the organization at a fairly uh, senior level otherwise you've invested in something which is um, not going to be used to its full potential So I think that one aspect is something that we've we've started looking at. We've also started now going to you know what Rekha said, which is tech not just for data and M and E, but also tech for program. So we are evaluating a fairly large proposal with a um, large non-profit working with you know half a million beneficiaries, and we're saying it's not just about collecting the data. So these are farmers. It's not just about collecting. which farmers doing what and what output and what crop or can we use technology to access market can we create market linkages using technology um is there a farm to table kind of product available for marginal farmers so you know really thinking beyond uh, what we've done before but saying and then as part of that saying that okay, they, they need a 15 member team to work across the board to build in that technology thinking so we you know that's part of the proposal of the developer thanks gayatri i we've almost run out of time so um i'm going to just ask my last question to all of you and then go around the room i think um you know while the world and atul talked somewhere about you know this whole trickle down effect of tech because we are seeing bangalore really go crazy with all this new tech and um obviously the silicon valley in the west you know lobo i'm sure you're seeing it in san fran uh, you know there's so much new age tech with ai and vi and a whole uh, blockchain coming in but if we talk about our ngos which are still grappling with excel over here you know what are your final thoughts in what should philanthropists do right like how do we bring them up to speed how do we move fast because yes it's in essential to handle yes it's essential to but we'll have to move a lot faster otherwise the world's going to move you know really fast and then where will the non profit space be left so any any thoughts any final thoughts in terms of what advice to give to the philanthropic community if we need to move um, up to speed with the rest of the world any of you i should invite the two techies why don't we start with atul since he's the he's my go to techie over here so uh yeah i've been out of tech ecosystem for 6 years it takes a while to sort of but uh, but when i think where we are is that uh, like you very rightly said we are at a very very early stage of tech adoption in the development ecosystem in the country uh, at the ngos level but also at the csr level that it is not that a technology corporate is using technology to manage their giving uh, even there the tools and technologies are not very simple uh, what you need there is a csr for example grant management fund management project and program management monitoring and evaluation and impact right and data obviously is a sort of underlying thing across uh and then there are reporting needs that you have on top of all of this for executive reporting management reporting uh, things like that uh outside of you know the attempts that gudara has made in this ecosystem there hasn't been too much and we haven't seen uh sufficient investments in that domain to give make institutional giving better Uh, and also bigger and easier so there is a play of technology that's happening in that direction that needs investments from independent platform organizations you also need uh, you know going forward a lot of uh, i think i briefly mentioned smarter platforms on giving like we know very little about our donors when i say i mean give india in particular as well but i'm assuming that's the same for all platforms who are these donors where are these donors what their biases are 
how much is their giving appetite what are their other giving uh, uh, sort of preferences that are not visible on our platform uh, how will that giver go and become a committed giver for the long term give better uh, i think the understanding of uh, you know the smarter understanding of the donors is not there uh, there is so much opportunity with blockchain as you mentioned to see uh, the transparency of impact all the way to the last mile all the way from the money touching the donor to all the intermediaries to the last mile uh, there are global experiments happen in this domain but in india nobody is investing in that yet it's still probably a few years away uh, uh, i think the uh, the power of technology is under leveraged but it is also under leveraged by funders and not just non profits and i think somewhere just uh, pools of capital to invest in the ecosystem starting with a support system for the non profit is an easier start rather than directly expecting non profits to be able to make investments inside out the good thing now is like gayatri said right uh, appreciation of value of technology is not a uh, 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 sort of a rare commodity anymore right people have consumed technology at an individual level thanks to mobile data and apps that everybody appreciates the value technology brings but to know what to do with that is something that has to come from outside and not within the sector and it will start from the funding ecosystem investing in that or platforms like giving day investing for its own use cases and some other use cases and as the foundation strengthens with technology the use cases will start to grow so so i'm hoping some specific funds collaborative efforts for this start to come in to make it easier thanks atul uh, rekha lobo uh, kaitri any last thoughts on this and uh, then we'll end the session so i can share my limit go ahead guys uh, i think when you say ai and machine learning they sound like you know scary tools but there are tools that can actually help us right? if it, and if i just take the example of say using ai for social media listening um it's a great way for data collection and much cheaper than you know working with three four ngos in every state let's take the example of covid if i want to understand what false information is out there on on covid on vaccines or um you know there i mean we know there's a lot of fake information out there flowing on whatsapp on social media if i have a tool that can actually constantly tell me what people are saying then as you know as non profits as philanthropists we can actually work with the government to help put out the right data right information have actual influencers uh, who people are listening to put that out there but it's so much cheaper and faster than working with uh, you know human beings across the country and trying to collect that data you then get the data you analyze the data by the time you have a solution people are talking about something else so you know there are tools we need to look at it as uh what is the problem what's the best solution it doesn't matter if it's ai it doesn't you know whatever term you want to use for it but what's the best solution to get quick responses and quick uh information out there thank you gayatri uh rekha lobo any final thoughts and then i'll close the session so uh you know so i i think it it is also for uh, you know to move faster right which is what your question was i think it's really also about building some um you know awareness is there but also just building the products and for trying to kind of you know use those systems then to really kind of expand at a at a faster rate you know if you know to use use something and to use it then with partners so i think to encourage collaboration also across ngos so that there is a lot of reuse because one of the things i've also found is there is in a sense a lot of duplication of effort because many people are you know utilizing uh, you know reinventing the wheel again and again for the same thing so whether it is through use of open source uh, systems or even by for an ngo to kind of create like a almost to create a module and use like almost like a franchise model to kind of expand right some of those things i think might help us to move up a little faster besides the other systemic uh, aspects which uh, you know atul and gayatri have spoken about which i am not going to you know repeat thanks ekka
Tobo finally. All yeah. Finished. So I just kind of give some random thoughts on what various, uh, what other people have spoken about, right? Um, so with regard to new technologies, right? I think uh, personally to me, like AI, ML and big data are probably going to be really big within the Indian NGO space. And a good example is like, we are working on a project right now with uh, a fairly large pharma co-op in India uh, using audio transcription to actually have audio chatbots to kind of just go past the literacy bottleneck out there. Right. And I think as we start doing these systems at scale, like I means give India is in a great position to start mining. They, they've got enough data right now to start mining to figure out how we can influence um, donor behavior. Right. So we need systems at that level of scale. And that's where I think platforms really come in. And that's where we, we can really make influential decisions. Um, but to me, the bigger problem means I don't, uh, okay, actually, uh, the, my second point is uh, kind of just addressing something what Atul said, right? I think from a development sector ecosystem, it's really great that we are downstream from all the receiving end of the Bangalore startups and Silicon Valley startups, right? Because there's such amazing building blocks coming down the pipe that for us to build on top of things are are really easy and makes things really easy. On the flip side, we've got to actually... Um, uh, educate the funders that, hey, these are really good ways of doing it and these are efficient ways of doing it. And um, very recently, we had a funding call where basically the funder told us like, hey, I heard some of your products have minimal of your code and are using external code to a large extent. And yes, that's true, but that's the power and uh, purpose of open source, right? And we are doing it in a legal, ethical manner. So there's some education of the funding ecosystem also got to be done. But to me, the larger problem is this, right? I don't think it's a technology problem. I think it's a knowledge problem and a curiosity problem. And if I had to go, it means put one thing to the inner, to the NGOs out there, right? I think NGOs have to be curious about how other people solve problems, right? If you're not looking at the way the world is solving similar problems, you're stuck in your own boat and you're not kind of having a wider view. So I would really encourage everyone to kind of take a broader look at the problem. And I think once we solve the knowledge and the curiosity problem and make more forward steps on that, like the technology aspect is a lot easier to solve. Like that's a solved problem in my head. Thank you, Lobo. Uh, let me just end. I think I'm running over time. So getting frantic messages on the site to like shut it as soon as possible. So thank you so much. Uh, it's been a very interesting panel. I think tech is one of my favorite subjects. I started with it in the nonprofit space. So um, to me, this is a very interesting subject. And I don't want to put plugs over here for CSIP, but we are thinking extensively about technology. We're actually working with Lobo and its team uh, to build a capacity building a piece that we do for a resilient strategy program for nonprofits at the end of this month. So look out for messages on social media. Uh, and to Lobo's point on, uh, you know, philanthropists need to be educated. I think this whole track for us is a pilot in a sense. So um, I think when you will be heard about it soon, but what we're trying to do is test if this works and what the conversations philanthropists have and what's the reaction we get from the community. So um, look forward to that as well. Uh, but just want to thank everyone out here, this team over here, I think had an interesting dialogue and it's very important from what I hear for both nonprofits and philanthropists to think of tech and not as tech as a separate piece, but inherent to program uh, and to work towards building a lot more platforms. Uh, so thank you all uh, for this wonderful dialogue. Since this is the last of our sessions uh, that we're doing for Disrupt Philanthropy, also want to thank a bunch of other people. Want to thank all the participants, speakers, and moderators. And a huge thank to Sudarsh, Sakshi, and Sinduja and the team at Nudge. Uh, thank you to Enmi. And thank you to all our funders who make this possible for us to have these dialogues and engage with a whole bunch of people. Also, thank you. Uh, to Gotham from the CSIP team and uh, Ingrid and the rest of the CSIP team that's been working behind this. So um, thank you uh, for this. We have a short video segment after this. This is actually um, because we've been talking about philanthropy. We decided to go back to philanthropists and told them to reflect and think about what they would have done differently if they were given a chance again. So this is something sort of of what, what would I have done differently and their reflections on it. So we're just going to try and see uh, how they would have worked differently in the last one and a half year or how they would have done the processes different and what they're learning from it. So Gautam, why don't we uh, play that video and start out? Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Bindi. Thanks, Bindi.
Hi, I'm Kiran Mazunda Shaw, and I'm delighted to participate in the series called I Wish I Had Thought of That. In fact, the second wave of COVID-19 that hit us is certainly something where we ought to view it in terms of what ought we have done better. When you think about the sense of complacency, the sense of hubris, and almost the return to normalcy that we were all enjoying in the month of March, nobody had ever thought of a second wave hitting us so badly. And it hit us so badly that it overwhelmed our medical system, our hospital system, and I think we were in a state of helplessness for quite a while. Woefully short of oxygen, woefully short of hospital beds, woefully short of doctors, nurses, you name it. We were in a mess. But then, like all pandemics, it peaks and then we were able to recover and then get our balance back. So, what is it that I had wished I had thought of to mute the second wave is really something we ought to discuss. Surveillance, vigilance, and better preparedness is what comes to mind. As we prepare for the next wave, I certainly think we have huge learnings from the second wave. Let's not just track the number of cases per day of COVID-19. Let's start tracking the number of new hospital admissions. Hospital occupancy, especially ICU bed occupancy and ventilators. So if we start tracking all that, we should have early warning signals, which we never bothered to track after the first wave. I also believe that we will be in a much better state of preparedness when it comes to uh, access to drugs and therapies and you know, medicines in general and RT-PCR tests in general. I think today we are in a slightly better state of preparedness than we were when the second wave hit us. And so that's what we really need to focus on. I also would like to see us using our resources in a very innovative way. You know, we've often talked about mix and match vaccine trials. We should do that fast. We should actually look at various treatment interventions that can actually prevent mortality. I think today we have a whole amount of ammunition that we didn't have in wave one and wave two. And it only started becoming apparent towards the end of wave two. Let's use that wisely. I know that antibody therapies are also now available to us. I know that many more vaccines are available to us and we must accelerate the speed and scale of vaccination because we know that you know over 90% of vaccinated people did not end up in ICU beds in hospitals. Very few of them ended up in hospitals, more as a precaution. And we also now know how to treat patients much better. So let's use our knowledge, our experience, and all our resources to fight the next wave in a way that doesn't really disrupt our lives. Thank you. Since I'm very closely associated with education, I would like to talk about COVID affecting education sector. We find that the poor are most affected during this period of COVID because the they were not going to school and had no devices to learn online or there was lack of Wi-Fi or there was one device between three, four siblings. We did provide a few uh, devices to the ninth and 10th, but still it's, the poor have suffered the most during COVID in education. Even today, though in some cities, 
cinema houses are open, malls are open, but they haven't given permission for schools to be opened. We suggested having 25% of the students coming each day with all the safety precaution. But somehow, in Maharashtra at least, this has not been done. During COVID, our kids also experienced a lot of violence because in a cramped place with unemployment, the tensions were high and very often this, were, this frustration was taken out on the children. One thing good that we have learned as industry is the plight of the migrant workers. During the first lockdown, we all saw terrible pictures of the migrant workers walking home, so many dying on the way. And during the second COVID, along with Dasara, a few NGOs and a few like-minded industries, we started something called the social compact. We in industries have looked after our organized labor very well, partly because of the numerous laws that demand it and they are unionized. But the unorganized labor, which consists of 90%, are really the neglected people. I was ashamed that though they were always there, we never gave attention or paid any heed to their problems. But as I said, some like-minded industries, NGOs along with Dasara in Mumbai, Pune and Ahmedabad started a movement called the Social Compact. We decided that we will uh, look after their plight and what kind of working conditions they have, what kind of wages we pay them, do we treat the men and women and give them the same pay, do we have toilet facilities for them, and several questions we would audit our own sites and our own places where we employ contract workers. And we want to start this movement of improving the conditions under which the migrant workers live. And hopefully over years, we can show some results. And the thing I learned was I wish I was more sensitive to this group of people many years ago. Hello, hello everyone. It's uh, great to be back uh, on this amazing platform uh, yet another year. Mm, so very briefly, I was asked to share what we learned in the second wave of COVID as a foundation and maybe also as an individual. Um, the one thing I guess Ford Foundation has always try to uh, insist upon uh, in the way we do grant making is to give grants that could help organizations in spending on themselves. In You may call it unrestricted funding, you may call it capacity building grants uh, or anything else, but basically this is money, this is support that uh, a foundation or a donor can provide to a, an organization to spend on themselves and not necessarily specifically on programs and projects. We think it's very important. And the second wave, um, if it did teach us anything about different ways of making grant making, I think it is one. Uh, it, this is one definitely because if you give uh, support to organizations uh, to be able to spend on themselves, um, we believe that it helps them so much uh, in situations like this. As far as what we could have done differently, maybe uh, what we could have insisted upon is be a little more aggressive in pushing other foundations, especially Indian founders and Indian uh, donors to also give grants that fit this definition. Because we do know that there are specific opportunities that are more accessible to Indian donors that are not accessible to um, international foundations like ours and maybe if we had been a little bit more insistent uh, to our partners to also do these kind of grants I think that would have been good. 
Hi, my name is Archana Chandra and I'm the CEO of Jayavaki Foundation. So though there are multiple learnings for myself and us at Jayavaki as an organization, I feel three really stand out for us. One, over the past 17 months, we've encountered challenges like we've never seen before, but it has pushed us to be more flexible and creative than we ever imagined. I am so incredibly proud of my team, which went the extra mile, stepped out of their comfort zones every single day to not only ensure the wellness and safety of our students and their families, but also created platforms to connect and continue with their healthcare and education efforts. Secondly, deep gratitude for our diligence and corpus building over the years, which has armed us with financial resilience and has held us in good stead in a time like this. And the third, the realization that our team's well-being must be as much a priority to us as our children. In order to address the growing concerns of employees towards health, we introduced medical insurance for our employees and their families. We also chalked out a wellness program for our team, which was launched on October 10th, 2020, which happens to be our Founders Day, as well as World Mental Health Awareness Day. What do I wish we had done differently? So we realized that our students and families were struggling to get vaccinated due to the logistical and financial issues. And so we organized a vaccination drive on our campus in collaboration with Just Look Hospital. At the drive, we met our children for the first time in nearly 15 months. We watched them come in on crutches, wheelchairs, some struggling to walk, but all with the most radiant smiles. We also observed that many of them had regressed physically in what they were able to do. Though we've been providing online therapy to our students, its impact has been limited. So we decided to conduct a medical therapeutic checkup for all our 700 children on our campus to provide need-based interventions under the supervision of a multidisciplinary team of doctors and therapists. We really wish we had started this sooner. What are the ideas that we wish we had thought of? I really wish we had started advocating for reopening of our programs sooner. I wanted to end by saying that, yes, COVID has been disruptive to all, but more so for our children. We know that as hard as we have worked, we must work harder. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for this wonderful session and to all our speakers who sent in the video. So thank you. I'm going to just end it over here. Sakshi, all over to you.